Hi, um, and welcome to Q&A session with Alex Ayn Arumbak, um, a director, producer of uh, ASMA. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, good morning, Alex. Who is Hi, Warren. At the nice moment. Um, yeah. So we are here to talk about ASMA. Uh, first thing first, I think, um, can you can you tell us more about how you come upon this project mm. and how okay. how do you get it made? Okay, um, as one well started um, as soon as President Duterte in the Philippines was voted, uh, this was in June June twenty sixteen. Uh, the killings in the Philippines started immediately, like on the day. Um, he had already been promising this during his campaign, you know, the fish will grow fat in Manila Bay with the bodies of drug addicts, verbatim. This is what he was saying. Um, and so people were, people were already aware of uh, these possibilities, and yet he won by a landslide. 16 million Filipinos voted for him. Um, and so the day after he, he was voted, um, the killing started and then for the next few months um uh you know our newspapers were filled with photographs um and it's these photographs that really got me um thinking so it was a photograph of a colleague um that i would say inspired me to really go and i contacted this colleague his name is rafi lerma he's a photojournalist um and then i asked to join the night shift and so for the next two years, this was the initial and the biggest research process that I did. I was going out every night, um, following basically the, uh, these, um, these news of bodies and killings all over Metro Manila. Um, is it, oh, it's two years, that's a long time. When do you, so for the two years, you, you already armed with a camera and perhaps yes. a um, document? Well, it, yeah, it was on and off. I really needed to take a lot of time to get out as well because it was a bit difficult. I mm -hmm. think uh, I had my limitations as well. So, um, yeah, I, but on and off, it was two years of um, filming and then, or two and a half, and then also half a year of editing. Okay. Then um, I'm, I, I'm not too sure of the, the distribution of this film. Um, what are the responses? Has it been screened in the Philippines? Uh, we screened it in the Philippines. It was, there was supposed to be a, um, a cinema premiere in March, but then of course it got cancelled due to COVID. So we, uh, we did a, an online release, a limited online release in July, because at the time the Philippine government passed an anti-terror law, which was, mm. we thought, you know, very terrible for our democracy. And at the same time, um, ABS-CBN, one of the largest TV networks, was closed down. Right. So we thought it was a good time to release the film. We did it for 30 hours. And yes, it, was, it had a very overwhelming response. Mm -hmm. And um, something that I realized was, um, because all of the things in Aswang, they were already in the news. You know? yes. um, okay. But people still got very affected by the film which made me realize um, that there is really a, you know, sometimes I think documentaries manage to do this, really bridge a gap between what you see in the news and then what really transpired, because I think it's a, it's a, it could provide a, like a bridge for understanding, really. Um, and I think that's what happened with this film. And so people were very affected. It was, um, it was received very well, actually, by Filipino people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, any any rebukes by the authorities or you know have not they... yet not yet um, no uh, and I'm happy about that <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but before we did, we released it again uh, for a local festival I left the Philippines just mm. to be sure okay right I I think a part of what makes it even in Singapore, I think, I mean, we, we read of it as well, maybe a little bit removed from the people. Yeah. Of the but um, one of the things that I think added to um, this feeling of astonishment while we go through the nightly visits with you uh, is, is it's just 
the sure look of it, I think. I, I mean, this, this night in Manila, uh, um, I, I'm not going to go into like the technicalities of it. Uh, the way how the, 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 the capture of wherever parts you are, especially at night, um, it, there's a special feel to it. I mean, mm. something akin to like, maybe like Michael Mann's downtown Los Angeles in uh, a collateral, you know? Mm-hmm. That kind of um, and, and it's it's uh, and we have we have been watching Philippines whether it's films or, or documentaries or what, but this is really new, I think. And part of uh, part of this this look of uh, um, these parts of the Philippines or Manila uh, really added to to like even greater layers of of of. Um, Astoundment, I guess, would be the word. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's just my observation. Yeah. Well, I worked with a very good cinematographer Mm -hmm. because by myself, I can't capture that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had a friend come in and we discussed how, you know, the atmosphere that we really wanted. And I think a lot of it also because um, I filmed for so long that I hate to say it, but some of the scenes, I already knew what was going to happen next. Uh, mm-hmm. especially in crime scenes. So I knew that you know, they were going to take away the body, they would put a candle, they would wash it away. And I could tell my cinematographer this, that this is what's coming next. Um, and so I think that was why um, we were able to prepare somehow um, and exactly have a, well, an idea of what we wanted to film um, by the time she came in. But thank you. Uh, okay, then um, I think we were also discussing among ourselves here that uh, at the same time we are engrossed by what is being shown to us. Uh, it is also quite visible at the back of the camera. Um, uh, how do you keep yourself safe going into mm. these night visits, you and the crew, and perhaps also the... When I was, um, I think mostly I was working alone, Um, like I was filming alone. Um, And when I, when I did that, I worked with a group of photojournalists. Mm -hmm. So at the time, especially when I didn't have um, funding, um, so I funded it myself. um, I I would go with photojournalists because um, it was safer to work as a pack. Uh, And then eventually when my cinematographer came, it was just the two of us and our drivers. So it was a very small and lean uh, team. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, I've been working um, on, on current affairs television mm-hmm. for a long time before, so I pretty much knew how to work my way as well, uh, even at night. There mm-hmm. were still moments when it was a bit scary. I, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> we were scared <laughs> for you. <laughs> you know, at the same time. They were definitely looking behind me all the time. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, yeah. and so the, they are, are they aware? then, um, I mean, the vigilante groups, um, are they aware that you are making a documentary uh, specifically of this subject? Or, I mean, no. No? Um, we, but the, the point is we, we tried to stay, I, I, we really tried to stay below the, under the radar while mm-hmm. making this film for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, this is also why it was titled A Swang. Because if you title a film as Swang, people think it's a fiction film. <laughs> so, right. so no one would assume that it's a documentary. And so we could apply for you know, um, grants and then send, send out paperwork. And the film is titled as Swang and no one really knows, at least in the Philippines, that no one would assume that it's a documentary. So this was actually also one of the reasons why I kept this as Swang idea um, the whole mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's a lovely idea that, you know, transverse, <laughs> the transverse, uh, there's almost yeah. a critical <laughs> uh, element to, to, to this really solid. Uh, it was, activity. yeah. It was a practical solution as well, actually. <laughs> yeah, it works that way too. Mm, how about the subjects? Like, how long do you take to locate them? And as well as, I guess you need a certain amount of time to build trust and rapport and, you know, um, which, which of the featured 
uh, persons in the film do you do, do you have the most problems with uh, mm. um so we had several um i was following several protagonists throughout the years um but i just decided on John Marie the kid and brother june brother june was very it's a very good and ideal um person for me but these two people um i went for them because i felt good with them like my heart was with them you know um and this sounds cheesy but this was really the biggest um qualification for me because for other people i felt that it became transactional you know in a sense that they only wanted to talk to me because you know they knew i would um help them or mm -hmm. and this is okay i mean of course i'm all for supporting this but i didn't want this idea that of an exchange or of you know um i yeah uh, so and also i was aware that with such a film um a lot of people were desperate you know a lot of people needed help and we did this we tried to help as many people as we can but whoever came out um it was strange but whoever was easiest for me and mm -hmm. the ones that i felt very good with they are also the ones that came through um on screen um you know like and i think that really reflects that's the thing your camera reflects your feelings towards your uh, towards these people so yeah i just decided also uh, on a narrative point of view that um i could end the film somehow when john marie's mother um came out um and then for Brother June, uh, we were working together for a long time and I saw how people reacted to him because he's a man of the church. Uh, mm -hmm. Filipinos are very religious. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, how they spoke to him and how they opened up to him was very different um, as how people would usually open up to journalists only. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw the value in that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I really admired what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I think when he started joining the night shift, everything changed because this man, he was helping people, you know, do something essential, which is bury their dead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was mostly a feeling, um, whoever I felt good with. Um, okay. An another, you know, uh, we were talking about this prior to this session. Um, how... how why do you choose to end at this point, for example? Because we, we felt that in no way this is a criticism, it's just an observation that um, we can go on, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's Jomari or what is going on there. Um, and being longer, because uh, there, there, there are certain situations that arise in the film, you know? and uh, we were a glimpse of the situation and you know and then and then it's it's over i mean it passes to another it's another character and all that um, um we we feel that it can be longer uh mm -hmm. and 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 there were there were then perhaps depth and weight to even more to as well the film um yeah so why why do you choose to end at, at this end? point mm -hmm. mm, well first i think it's also a personal thing because um it was going on too long for me mm -hmm. um and i mean i mean i was ready to do this for a long time but for my sanity as well i thought um i needed i I always compared it to the light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. and I needed to see that I was getting closer because it was also a very heavy experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that I knew that things were not going to change um, for the next few years. Um, and so we really wanted to, we really wanted to uh, release the film um, soon enough that it would have some time to circulate in the Philippines mm -hmm. and for more people to see it in time for the next election. So this was also one of the reasons. It's all practical reasons, I would say, actually, um, as to why we ended at this point. Um, I, I thought that, okay, we have to end it this time because um, 
uh, I have to, I want to work, start working on the film and then I just worked with whatever I had. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically we wanted to to have the film, give the film enough time to circulate in the Philippines, at least a year, mm -hmm. so that by the time 2022 comes, which is the next elections, it would be mm -hmm. seen. I'm not so sure how much it can do, but you know, all of us are trying to do yeah, something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was actually the biggest reason. In that way, um, how do you plan to then uh, circulate this film within um, yeah. in, within the yeah. uh, Philippines? Uh... So right now, of course, the first and easiest thing was to do um, online screenings. Mm -hmm. So we tried to give it for free um, to as many people as possible. And then we are working with organizations to screen it um, in grassroots communities as well, you know, people that don't have access to the internet. So it's it's a very um, handmade, you know, <laughs> uh, uh. local thing that you do. You really have to um, go enter communities um, one by one. However, of course, COVID um, yeah. uh, made things complicated. But now, when I realize it, it was a really good thing that we <laughs> released last, uh, you know, this year because of the situation, um, yeah, it, giving everyone time to adjust. And also in the eyeballs on the laptop. I mean, you know, yeah, it really, spending yeah. even more time uh, and, and the content, less distractions out there for us <laughs> yeah. to engage in. True. Uh, this was yeah. probably why it was received so, um, so, you know, like so many, because we had like 500,000 views in 30 hours when it first when we first released it and i think people it was because people were forced to be at home um and so that's why it had so many you know, like mostly young people watching okay um we have time for one question um can we can i ask then looking forward um uh what's not the plans for your film, but are you working on something else on, on, mm. on uh, you know, as, as, as a documentary film or otherwise? Yes, I just started something, mm. um, but it's just writing for now. Um, but it's, it got me a bit um, excited actually, because, you know, then, yeah, it's this very early stage and things are very flexible and things are, ideas are still allowed. So <laughs> yeah, I'm working on something. I just can't say it right now because um, mm. I might not get back to the Philippines. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, situation <laughs> changes and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, I just actually want to add one yeah. thing. Um, I'm not sure if many Singaporeans know this, but one of the reasons why President Duterte was, um, because Singapore is known to be an orderly uh, society, country, every Filipino wants the Philippines to be Singapore. And this is, uh, you know, this is sort of the ideal. And one of the reasons why President Duterte was voted was because people said, if we had such a leader, we would be like Singapore. And I have not, I have said this before to my Singaporean colleagues and all of them were laughing because all of them also said, but we did not have such, a, <laughs> we did not have, you know, what's happening uh, with you. And this is also a joke now, if you would see in, in social media, you know, if whenever things are like people are being killed, people would just comment, yes. We are now really a lot like Singapore, you know, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just a, uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if people um, people if if you guys know this, but this was um, this is a misconception um, of Filipinos thinking that um, your country became this way because of you know of what our president is doing, and um, yeah, so this is just also something that we I don't know how to we are trying to you know um, change uh, this idea that. Uh, Sure. No, so some, some exchange good. about, you know, like views of Singapore on the other side to Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's a, it's just a, it's a very un, uninformed and um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's an uninformed uh, view um, that people get from, for instance, when Marco, they would say President Marcos before was, it was a good time for our country. All these things that um, it's misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it's it's very pervasive right now in the Philippines, and that's the problem. Uh, it's something we are trying to change. I guess that that makes what you do even more urgent. I guess to reach out to people and in in in, in not directly feeding information, but you know, clearing views or giving an alternate reality. I, yeah, I always just thought that if people were seeing what I was seeing, or you know, like I, right there, and this is why we tried to transmit these feelings to, through the film, then they would um, understand, or they would see it the same way as I see it. Um, and that was the goal. That was just what we wanted. Okay, okay. I mean, un if under no COVID circumstances, maybe you'd like to make a film in Singapore to show the <laughs> Uh, what, how, and you know, whatever it is. Yeah. This is not. <laughs> they you did know. not get there through that. Okay? Stay clear of the Malayan and stuff like that because there's a lot more. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Alex, I mean, I, I wish, you know, uh, we are in a circumstance where we can fly over and then we yeah. can talk a bit more. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's keep in touch and yeah. hopefully... In, uh, thank you so much for having the film. No, thank you for making the 